Welcome back to the Cross Games Podcast. I'm your host, Chase Singer, with Adrian Conway, and we are going to talk about what makes someone a professional CrossFit athlete. We'll touch on some subjects there, who we do and don't think are maybe fitting that bill in the sport. And then the next question is how we, which comes up, I feel like this has been the question for like the last three or four years, is professionalize the sport better. Matt O'Keefe will be joining us here in about 20 minutes to provide his background feedback expertise to say the least of when it comes to this subject but uh speaking of professionals we we're the nfl has started mm. offline and i forgot how much i love nfl season <laughs> makes my heart smile bro I'm, I'm i'm even just excited to watch the college games like this this is it's interesting for me because of course you, you know I, I grew up playing football i played football till i was 24 years old till i found crossfit and um there was a time in my life where like I I I, I kind of walked away from football, right? Like I was mm. I was so obsessed with our sport in our space, my own training, getting involved in different things in my life. And now I'm like back to where it's like, oh yeah, I oh like, yeah. <laughs> I'm watching a game and my palms are sweaty and I'm like, <laughs> you know, speaking way too loudly as if I'm commentating yeah, the game. Yeah, Not yeah. just the CrossFit games, but like literally commentating the football game. My wife's probably like, okay, this is enough. I got to deal with this enough when there's CrossFit on TV, let alone, you know, so I'll, my wife makes fun of you for this, but I'll relate it to watching a football game. Since you've played and you were a running back, when you see someone play, do you watch as if you're kind of do like, do you, do you move when you watch the, like when you know he needs to jump cut to the left and like hit that, you're like, you see the open hole. like. (laughs) I, I have a better disconnect than that at this point. It used okay. to be. Now, now here's where, where I struggle, though. I'm coaching six-year-old flag football, bro. Oh. <laughs> yeah, pray for me. <laughs> me pray for me. This is like the greatest test I've ever experienced in my entire life. I'm yeah. extremely competitive. I love to win. And I'm, I'm, you know, I'm very direct and stern and like, yo, do this, don't do that, right? Six-year-olds, I'm like, okay, I'm going to show them grace. I'm going to make sure these boys have fun. Like, we're coming back. I want them to come back and play again. Yeah, we're just going to have fun, guys, right? We're just going to have fun. So the whole game, I'm just kind of like holding my, I just, there's so many things I want to say and so many things I want to yell. And so I'm just holding them back, holding them back. So when they're out there and someone gets the ball, I guarantee I'm back there if there's a camera on me and I'm like, yeah, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Like I'm trying to do everything I can for these kids. I literally yeah. cut myself the other night. That it's rare that teams are actually trying to pass, right? But a team dropped back and just oh, threw yeah. it in the air. I found myself running towards the ball, like yelling <laughs> ball, 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 ball. Oh. Thank God I didn't even interfere oh. with the interfere with the play but yeah man it's good to have football back it's exciting my son had his flag first flag football game of the season uh he's five and six so he's in kindergarten so that's like yep, his yep. his age range and i'm assistant coaching so for me it's just getting everybody lined up and i'm like it's like kids forget their name oh. out there or they get in the huddle and they're just like pulling each other's flags in the huddle no my percent guys 100 percent. look I, my my whole goal this year is like i want to be able to have them huddle up and mm. go to the line without me like pulling them to where yeah you know and i got it on, i got on my ipad i'm like hey guys this is where you're gonna line up <laughs> right this is it yeah. you're a right guard you're a left guard you're a center you're my f you're my go yeah. and then right. they're all over the place and i'm trying to fix them so it's 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 a really fun thing it's very rewarding but at the same time oh my gosh it is literally the most challenging thing and yeah, yeah. just getting them to line up and every every time they come back to the huddle they're like so are there snacks tonight again? Or like, I got to pee, dude. And I get a break and I'm like, bro, I get asked about two snacks plates. in the second quarter. Hey, we get snacks. I'm like, we're playing football right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's so hard. I don't it's care so about your damn snacks. Yeah. Yeah. I just submit to it. Sometimes I'm like, yeah, we will. What, what kind of snacks do you think we're going to get? Yeah. yeah. Oh, and then they're just like, oh, I don't, I don't know. And then, you know, I'll just roll with them sometimes. Cause I'm like, look, I can't fight it. <laughs> can't beat them. Join them, bro. Oh, yeah, the joy of that. So, yeah, we had flag football on Monday, and then my son had soccer yesterday. And I don't know what happens at, like, the 4 to 5 range and then the 5 to 6 range, but we had what felt like a legitimate soccer game last night. Like, it's still mob ball, but we had big kicks and running after the ball and just, like, like the tenacity to continue to play. And I mean, my wife and I were sitting at dinner, and we were talking about the game, as if like we were in, like we enjoyed the game. Yeah, like you're like, oh, they played pretty good. They did this. They My did that. My daughter played on Saturday, and she's three. Different game. Like she almost scored, and then 
she asked if she could have water. And I was like, and me, I was like, not yet. We got a minute. And then she just started crying and then quit. <laughs> and I was like, damn, you got to love it, man. You, you can't, can't win. Water. You, you can't win. It's, it's, it's too funny. And Elijah, I'll equally share that. Elijah also plays soccer on the weekends because football for us is like Tuesday, Thursday. Soccer is like Friday, Saturday. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it's his first year playing soccer, but it seems pretty good. It's pretty spread out. I mean, it's only what, like 4v4 on a relatively oh, small that's field. Nice. Yeah, 4v4, relatively small field. Um, okay. You can have defenders, but no official goalie. Yes. So the, yeah. so it's a small goal. So it's it's pretty cool. They do a good job. But yeah, it's different. Like they they understand the format and play of soccer. It's much more natural for them than like stop and go and the, mm -hmm. the formalities of football. But yeah. Anyway, so we went from like we're, we're about to talk about dads. professional athletes. Yeah, we're professional dad slash coaches. But uh, to my original question about you watching football, when I watch swimming, my like if they're ever doing like breaststroke or butterfly, I'll be in my chair just being like. And my wife took a video and I'm just kind of like moving with them and watching the Olympics. And oh, oh yeah, really, I can't. Oh, by the way, Olympics less than a year. That's crazy. Oh, it's crazy. Such a good time. Such a good yep. time. But uh, all right. So for today's show, we're going to talk about a topic that you brought up with me the other day and yeah. all centering around professional CrossFitters or professional athletes or professionalizing the sport of CrossFit more. Uh, the last episode we talked about was the history of other sports in the space and relating that to CrossFit. And I think we try to give themselves some CrossFit games, some grace as far as, look, it's been 17 years and look how far we have come, how quickly relative to other sports, taking some liberties with timelines and, you know, some of the times like, yeah, I get it. This was made in like 400 BC time moved a little slower, <laughs> a little slower than to Much get slower. around the world. Right. Send a Raven for the next game. Right. The other team wants to play. I get it. Right. But where it, took sports hundreds of years on average to go from like conception to a championship game, right? Or an official league and what cross has done in that time frame. And I've seen this question come up on multiple podcasts over the last couple of weeks, uh, just coincidentally is framing what makes a professional cross a games athlete mm -hmm. and what's involved with that, how the sport can evolve to foster more of that. I think that's the main goal for everyone that's involved with the sport of CrossFit, which we effectively just call the CrossFit Games, uh, separate than CrossFit, the training methodology, is who is that, what it takes to become that, how do we define that, and how do we foster that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's interesting, right? Because I, I can... I literally was working with some athletes that I coach and train and have been to semifinals yesterday. Um, a bunch of them or a few of them will be in town to take part in Wadapalooza qualifiers that are coming up. Right. So we're going to go week, week one, okay. they're going to get Started together tomorrow starts tomorrow. tomorrow. Yeah. Starts right. tomorrow. So, and, and this kind of ties into the topic eventually because it's like, cool, there's other opportunities for athletes to compete, grow their personal brand, flex the muscle of competing so that they can be better and more prepared when the moment uh, appears. But it's like, I was asking them, I was like, so what do you, what do you guys consider professional within our space? Like, this is something that you're trying to achieve actively right now. What would you say? And some of them were like, well, I guess maybe if you've been to semifinals, there's likely been some type of support <laughs> that was allocated your way perhaps. And so is that exchange enough to be considered professional? And then of course, other athletes bring up like, well, does it matter the source of your income, right? Does it matter if it's just a brand, like a sponsorship, does that make you professional or does it have to come from winning? and mm. receiving funds from a particular competition like the CrossFit Games, like a semifinal or a larger competition like Rogue, Wadapalooza, Dubai, et cetera. And so, yeah, I think it's just a healthy conversation to have um, primarily because it's it, right now it's it, it, it is it is very like it's hard to grasp and hard mm -hmm. to quantify because athletes are in such different perspectives and walks of their life. Um, so uh, yeah, I'd be interested to, to kind of start there. Like what, what's your opinion, Chase, in regards to like what, in, in your mind, what makes someone within our space, a professional, uh, CrossFit athlete? I think as basic as I can make it without creating too much gray is that if you can make an independent salary doing it and it can come from multiple avenues, it can come from sponsors because like any professional athlete, like, and especially if you, we just talked about the Olympics, Olympic athletes have to basically supplement their income with competitive uh, competitions, winnings from those competitions. But the most I think they have to get money from is sponsors to support them 
doing it. This is a, a demographic, if you think of the Olympic athletes in particular, they really get a spotlight once every four years. I know there's world championships and national championships when it comes to that. But I think if you look at Olympic athletes, they're probably the closest we could relate to what a games athlete is really like. And games athletes gets four times more, basically, major competition exposure than these individual Olympic athletes. No doubt. And likely even more than that, right? Because then we kind of break it down, not just at the CrossFit Games to compete, but like we mentioned, the, the Wadapaloozas, the Rogue Invitational, um, the things that are continually growing within our space. But it's a... Uh, for me, I completely agree with you, man. I, I think that it is, if there's an exchange for your fitness and your expression, whether you're representing brands that exist out there um, or whether even, you know, it, it comes from, from some other source, someone that's just kind of supporting you. Uh, but if you have your means of living supported by you doing fitness and or training or representing those brands, then I think it, it solidifies you as a pro. Now, of course, there's going to be levels to this and there's there's huge disparity within our space right now, mm -hmm. um, which brings up another interesting topic, like the disparity between, you know, top female competitors within our space and their income Ooh. versus top male competitors in our space and their income. Okay. Because if you ask me, from what I know and, and the, the interactions that I've had, I mean, clearly I've, I've helped co-found a supplement brand within our space, you know, in 2017, man, we've paid some handsome salaries to some athletes mm -hmm. and most of that money was going to females. I'm going to be completely honest. They were helping us move hey. the product. So right? in the, some of that comes from uh, when you look at like NIL money that is in high school and college now with, with that whole system of young athletes being paid in that respect is like the biggest currency for getting sponsored and basically proving yourself as a sponsorable athlete is your social media reach to a certain extent or your quote influence on others. I don't want to use the I word too much, right? To it's influencers, right? Yeah. You oh yeah. That's what, that's what you're push the product. And if you're going to take a, and you're right in the f female CrossFit space, there are athletes that are, maybe games level athletes that have five, 10, 20 X more followers than some of the best male athletes in the sport. Some of the best male athletes that's ever done it. And that's just a product of popularity. It is. It is. And, and, it, and it feels like, you know, there are people who, because this is, here's where we get into this is like, there's an entitlement from athletes who achieve things at a high level mm -hmm. and, and there, and there should be to a degree, right? Like they're like, Hey, well, I'm the best in the world. Shouldn't, shouldn't I receive more funds or more support or more financial backing than X person? And the ultimate question is like, what value do you bring your brand that you're representing? So if I'm paying you an exchange, if I'm paying you, we're going to use a, 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 an amount of like a thousand dollars a month. If I'm paying you a thousand dollars a month stipend to support your efforts and your journey, where's the $1,000 a month plus that I'm receiving because I work with you. Right. Is it quantifiable? Is it measurable? Um, can I track it back to you? Because that's when that's a no brainer for me. Right. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness. I, if I work with this athlete, if I pay them $5,000 a month, I know I get back seven and a half or 10 because of their influence. Excellent. This is a wonderful relationship. It's like an employee, right? Chase would be silly. If I were like, Hey buddy, I'm going to hire you. And all the work that you do is going to help me break even as a business owner. It actually starts to make no sense. I'd be better off without, with one less employee right. with a one-to-one -one relationship. Like that's one less responsibility I have as a business owner or my marketing team has to reach out to. There's so many things for people to, or athletes particularly to understand, um, in regards to this exchange. And it does become a bit of a popularity contest because of the reach and not just the reach, but the density of your influence on that reach. Because mm -hmm. bro, we've got people with millions of followers who don't listen to a word they say because they're looking at them because they're like, they, they look really good in the very little clothing right. or people like to obsess over watching them, but they're not really like taking their advice on how to train or what to take or how they recover or the kind of mattress they yeah. All these different things. I mean, so, like, okay. The, another example is like, okay, say you have this young athletic female athlete who might have a million followers. It's like, are those all the same demographic of followers or like 900,000 of them men who like to look at them in their pictures? Therefore, the products this female athlete may be associated with don't in line with 90% of their followers. Yeah. I mean, and, it, and, it, and it, it can be astronomical in regards to like what you assume. And what is the reality? Mm -hmm. And people can hit you with all kinds of quantifiable measures. Of course, um, they're, they're athletes with, with professional representation, as we'll get O'Keefe on here in just a little bit. Like He's got plenty of experience with this and talking with companies and helping negotiate relationships. But it's like there's statistics out there that 
can look one way, but actually show you another thing, right? Like if you work with someone, they're like, well, this, this person gets this many views to every post and this many likes, and they're expecting you to offer them a lump sum based off of that data. Yeah. The bottom line for me is if I'm a supplement company, how many tubs of product can you help me sell? How many, right. how many, how many fish oil pills can you help me distribute to the masses? Like those are the things that like you've got, how many t-shirts are you going to help this brand sell? Or, or, you know, if you're, if you're noble or you're rad or you're, or you're tier, or you're all these different brands that push into our space, how do you help them grow? Mm -hmm. And the bottom line is make money. That's a question that athletes should get good at answering because if they want to be supported, that's what they're going to have to bring to the table. Mm, I like that. And it's a good perspective to have because of, you know, you have been in a uh, position to sponsor people and using that information as, okay, okay, now you have these sponsorship dollars, but it's like, you know, <laughs> back in my competition days, it's like I had sponsors, like, you know, my first one ever was two food, right? And I got shorts and I thought I was like, I thought I was the coolest thing ever, right? <laughs> That's but right. never once did I consider myself like, professional athlete because I was like still coaching in the gym like every second I could just to pay rent mm -hmm. right this competition gig you know 10 15 years ago is a different thing back in the day shoot I would say like more than 50 percent of the people competing at the CrossFit Games could because they were coaches or affiliate owners right they had the time and the I would say time as a resource to put some extra time in it and now we have people that do this quote professionally slash do you just do this full time Mm -hmm. Right, because mm -hmm. I think there's a difference between a full time CrossFit athlete and a professional CrossFit athlete. Yeah, and and I mean for me, I'll use myself as an example, Chase. Like I, I had you know, I, I've gotten to be at the game several times. I was only there once as an individual in the open category. Right in 2015, I finished 21st. Certainly far from like a highly touted or highly talked about um, level of achievement at the CrossFit Games. But because of my personal brand, I was able to have some financial support and backing through great companies throughout the years. Mm. And I bring this up because even with that support, whatever it brought me in monthly, I was still coaching. I was still busting my tail in the affiliate. I was a head coach and brands were able to pay me so that I could represent them. And so that I could spend a little less time on the floor. They were considering me, right? They were like, Hey, yeah, yeah. we yeah. want to support you so that cool, give your best effort, represent us at the highest level. And then also we want to help you. So you don't got to coach six classes a day. Maybe you can coach two or three spend more time training and recovering, minding your nutrition. Like that's the opportunities that this is going to help provide for athletes down the road. This is to me how we professionalize the sport. But even in my own experience, I'm like, bro, I was, I was, I was semi pro at best in the sport of CrossFit, <laughs> right? Semi for, semi pro is the way that I would categorize myself, bringing in X from uh, financial support from, um, you know, sponsors, and then bringing in X still from my guaranteed pay from whether it was teaching seminars for CrossFit or if it was coaching full time, uh, because it's like you, you, it still wasn't, I, you know, I was married already. Mm -hmm. My wife luckily did have an adult job at the time. So she was kind of <laughs> the one that was carrying our health insurance, uh -huh. like the adult stuff, right? Like yeah. me, I'm just like, I get married and I'm like, I don't got health insurance. I don't need it. Yeah. I don't know what that is. He's like, yeah, yeah, I, don't <laughs> yeah I do. I do CrossFit. That's my health insurance and it'll be no big deal. Oh, did you have kids yet when you like towards the end of your series? Yeah. Towards the end, uh, 2017 is when Elijah was born. And so okay. that was my last year, right? Going team. And yeah. that was, that was when we, we, uh, upset the mayhem there as most people would that consider we, big push. Like, Hey, this is the, this is the season where we're all in. Cause I I've got one or did, was Elijah born yet? Or was he on the when, way. We, when we made the choice to go team that year and be like, hey, we're putting all of our eggs in this basket, all six of us that we're mm -hmm. going to go on that team, um, he, we were expecting. Okay. So he was born in March that year, like a, a couple weeks before, you know, semifinals in, yeah. in April would be rolling yeah. around the corner. So um, it was it was one of those things that was a very strong deciding factor for me. And we were so we, we launched uh, FNX in um, August at the games that year. So it was like, we had this buildup of like, mm -hmm. I'm going to be stepping away from competing. Cause I can just no longer prioritize it. Right. Um, but it was like the real life things that had to be a consideration for me. Uh, and that's kind of where, you know, it, it, it was one of those things that considers like, okay, I gotta, I gotta get some things in order and help myself, uh, right. be a little bit more adult. Does that, I mean, put a better perspective of what someone like Annie can do or Ariel Lowen or like even Pat Vellner or Brent Ficat, like parents mm -hmm. that can still keep this high level of competitiveness and maybe forge some sort of professional career out of it. 
Yeah. I mean, I think it's a beautiful thing. And I think that we're coming into an age where now it's like you could be, and I don't know all of these uh, athletes, personal lives or situations. Mm -hmm. Um, I can say that, that I had the desire to be the primary provider within my family and, or like that was the way that we wanted to be as we started to have children. So my wife had more freedom, right? So I'm using this as an example for us. My wife had more freedom to allocate her time with our children and raising our littles until they at least hit the kindergarten age, perhaps. Okay. Um, and uh, with that being said, for me, that's why I had to make those decisions because I wasn't pulling in the bank. I'm mm-hmm. certainly not a Frazier or a Froning. I'm certainly not that like a top 10 perennial individual games athlete. So I had to make these choices. I think now at, we're at a space where between the growth of social media, the way that you market yourself as an individual, I think that there's perhaps opportunities out there for people to create partnerships that they could be the primary breadwinner of their family and still be a 15 to 20 CrossFit Games athlete. You're in and you're out if you're there. Yeah. Brands would probably not have a problem associating with you again, as long as you're willing to put forth the effort and the time to, to have that content you know, provided for bringing them value. <laughs> Yeah. And, and like you said, life circumstance and personal availability at home and, and things like that. Some of the behind the scenes that we don't necessarily know about uh, some of these athletes and, and what they have at their disposal uh, and gives them the ability to pursue this type of endeavor. But yeah. when, you, when you look at the professional, like what you would define as the professional crosser, you know, I, I said as simple as like making an independent living doing mm-hmm. this only, whether through competition, sponsorship, uh, camps, maybe being able to provide some type of monetary supplementation to their lifestyle. Um, yeah, I feel and like so, really those three. Yeah. And, and, and I don't know, what, what do you look at? Well, and let me ask you this, when you say camp, so you're saying like an example, so everyone watching and understands it's like, Hey, if, if, uh, HWPO has Katrin on a salary because she represents HW folks, I don't, I don't know that this is right. truth. I'm using this as an example. But if we do have Matt coming on, so (laughs) you can ask him. Oh, yeah, perfect. That's right. So, but a camp like that might provide a salary for an athlete because they represent their brand. If 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 future clients or potential clients watch them perform and they're like, wow, I want to get on that track. I want to, right? They're helping to move product and support them that way. I think that could be that could be a thing, and it might be a very big thing in some of these camps. Mm -hmm. Um, so that that is certainly one. But I would say, yeah, potential camp money. Uh, of course you want to, you want to bet on yourself for winning, for winning. Um, and then of course, like regular post and content, uh, you know, got it income, but, but for me, right. And, and this is me. And I'm curious again, I want to hear what, what O'Keefe has to say about this when he gets ready to join us, but it's like, as an individual, um, like as a business owner, if right. I'm approached by an athlete, athletes like, Hey, this is what I would like. Okay. Um, this a month, or this is what their agents asking me, right? I want, I want $2,000 a month. I want to, I'm going to do four posts, one a week, this many stories. And I'm like, okay. Um, in my mind, this athlete is, they, they want a guarantee like they want this salary. What I want to entice them to do is bet on themselves. So mm-hmm. I want to be like, Hey, all that money that we would guarantee you, let's half that. And then what I want to do is double that. If you get on the podium at the CrossFit games this year, Ah, like incentives, I, w- I want your face to be associated as a winner and I want you to dominate other people in fitness. That's, that's what I'm looking for. Right. Like I want, I want that to be your voice. Yeah. And if, if athletes are willing to do that, I think there's a bigger opportunity for them. Right. Like, let's say you can negotiate deals where it's like, Hey, every time I win something, I want your company to match it or, you know, half it in, in, in gain or whatever it is in okay. dollars, but you don't have to pay me anything monthly. Mm-hmm. Right. I'm just kind of betting on myself. Now that's risky. That's risky for the athlete, of course, because, injury and all those different things exist, but these are just different ways that, that people can explore like yeah. getting financial support. Okay. Uh, speaking of risky, we're going to bring in Matt O'Keefe to the, <laughs> hey, there he is. have you changed, have you changed from yesterday? Chase? I, I, uh, <laughs> I'm in the he same just position. sat right there at the desk the whole time. Yeah. I'm in the same yeah. position and I am wearing a different, different shirt. shirt. <laughs> although i see you wearing the same hat as you were uh, yesterday so yeah. yeah my uniform's pretty you know pretty standard solid. right this this <laughs> gray shirt some days black others oh well, hey sounds, man uh, so, sounds like we, we need uh you need an agent adrian from what you were talking about so that was going to be my exactly. next question <laughs> okay uh, matt o'keefe joining the show ceo of hwpo thank you for uh, for your time i know uh thanks for having me you get yes. pulled in a lot of directions everywhere so i i do appreciate this and we were, we were discussing kind of our first blush takes of what we think of or what would be um, how we would define 
being a professional and, you know, Adrian and I both landed on being able to make an independent living outside of say like a different job than the sport at which you are playing or competing in. And that can come from, you know, sponsors, competitive winnings, uh, maybe some type of like camp um, supplementation financials, depending on the place at which you're tied into. Um, but the next question I was coming up with was, was agents have been, I would say growing in popularity as far as awareness probably the last three to five years, but they have been in this space, I would say for the least 10. I mean, Matt, you yeah. don't get me, correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like your first kind of toe in the water in the CrossFit space was in that role. It was, you know, I started uh, a brand in the space, but quickly became attracted to, you know, helping people that so red cared about red line yeah, so baby red, red yeah. Line yeah 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 <laughs> and but that's how i met matt and like you know he he was getting you know a ton of attention pretty immediately after some of his success even prior to me meeting him by the way which was 2013 regionals he had a ton of success then he won the ecc which is where i first met him that year when the ecc used to be in october and he had some things coming out of him and i'm like you know Hey, I've always been attracted to that. Like, it, you know, people have the things that they look at in life, like want to be a professional athlete, which, you know, was a part of my life, you know, playing sports in college. And then, you know, I quickly was, you know, it's the Jerry Maguire thing. You know, I see that, but it's like, you know, I wanted to do that. Like, that was something I was like, you know, a dream attracted to, you know, and, um, it, you know, he gave me the opportunity uh, to, to care for him. And it really didn't, it was like more of a like opportunity to cut my teeth more than it was like a business thing at that point. Mm -hmm. I like really, I really liked Matt. Um, I had a sales background. I was in a family business that had that involved in it. And I just said, you know, Hey dude, like, let me just at least watch out for you because the first thing I had looked at for him, I was like, this is not fair, you know? And I was like, it'll be 10 years soon. Like we've known each other for 10 years. Yeah um like about today like we met in september of 2013 so i remember uh, that whole weekend with you coming in and matt with red line and his star rising in eccs because we were there it's like kill cliff was a big part of that whole right. deal and uh you know i was being on the broadcast side of of that event and just the buzz and like it looked like everybody was just buckling for launch that like a rocket ship that was going to be Matt Fraser. That and the space, like it's really, if we look back at like, you know, uh, things, you know, boiling to, to boil over, like that was it. Like it was starting to happen. The eyeballs were crazy around it. The excitement, the participation was wild with the open. The open was starting to just explode. Uh, so yeah, like honestly today we're now together, but like it was really just myself and Jason St. Clair at the time. Mm. You know, Jason was doing it on his own, was a base baseball agent and uh, worked with uh, Camille and Josh Bridges at the beginning just yeah. because he was a CrossFitter and got connected to those guys, was a part of X Endurance, like worked a little deal. It's similar to me. Like I worked a deal with Matt on Redline and then, you know, kind of helped him on this side. You know, we just recently merged, you know, what I was doing with Daniel Robbins into what Cooper and he are doing with Lab. Um, which is really something I'm super proud of because those guys are great people first and they've done a great job, you know? Yeah. It's, um, there's a lot of us now in a good way. It, you know, it's also, you know, it's gotten really big and cuckoo, you know, <laughs> uh, and you guys like, you guys ask like the, you know, that, that key question of like what makes a professional athlete a professional athlete. Right. I, I truly believe it's the moment that somebody like, puts their foot into, you know, being professional and betting on themselves. Like the okay. money aspect, yeah, professionalizes you and earning, but it starts way before that. I mean, the, the biggest trap we always run into in CrossFit is like thinking this is different than other things that have happened in other sports. We guys, we've all individually talked about it, talked about it on podcasts. Sometimes we do like I've learned more recently too that there is a lot of things that are unique to this, and had some great conversations with leadership at CrossFit about that, and you know even on the sides of like what we're doing there it is niche you know unique at times like there are different differences like you can I've done a long time like hey this is just like golf it is and it isn't like there's a volume factor like there's things that are different 
But when it comes to like sports marketing, partnership, professionalization, you know, which is like, I had a mentor that was an MBA and golf agent and, you know, he's grounded me in that. It's like, don't reinvent the wheel here, kid. Like this is pretty simple, straightforward stuff. It's just a different, you know, venue for it. And you can help form that over time too and help people understand that. But yeah, it's, you know, we have people all the time. I have historically for the last 10 years that, you know, come to me and say, I want to be a professional CrossFitter. And it's like, how do I do it? And it's like, well, you're doing it. Just go better on yourself. Like that's, mm-hmm. Hey, you guys have done it professionally too, aside from just the athlete side, right? How do you get to do what you're doing now today for your roles in life from professionally? Mm-hmm. You took a step in a direction that was scary that you had to invest your time and energy in and not knowing necessarily what was in it for you, you know? Yeah. Um, and I've done it professionally at an extreme level. Like I, I understand it a lot. Like I quit a job, you know, my wife thought I was insane, you know, and started Redline because I believed in it. I was passionate about it and I worked my butt off to get places through it. Um, and still do today. But like, that's how you become a pro is like, you know, really going all in. I like that a lot. And that would actually make me kind of amend my initial answer because I mean, Adrian and I did a podcast last week about CrossFit games being actually the fastest growing sport in history. If you look at what has happened from conception to where we are now in 17 years, no other sport has been able to do this. Maybe the MMA in a certain aspect, but we looked at like eight major sports that the world has known for the last couple hundred to a thousand years. And if you just look at the NFL in the 60s and 70s and baby 80s, all of those professional athletes, which I think we can all sit back and say they are professional athletes, most all had side jobs to supplement their professional sport. And so, yeah, yeah, putting a monetary value on professionalism, I, I will amend maybe some of that independent lifestyle of what you're saying is like, you are putting all your efforts into becoming that, so therefore you are. Hmm. This guy, there's a, there's a guy I'll, I'll here love. making a com- comment that's actually a really good point, which is just, you know, hey, if I quit my job and go play golf, right. I'm not a pro golfer. That's a great point. The answer is no, but, but like, you know, I think what the separation is here, you're, you know, we're – um, looking at what success looks like, that's, there's a difference. So, you know, mm-hmm. golf's a really good example that I'm incredibly connected to. Um, I have a, t- like, I support people pursuing professional golf. I have a kid at my club that um, played at Duke and wants to be a pro. He's a pro. Why? Because he went out, come out, we raised money, and he's going trying to qualify for everything. That's a pro. Is he a successful pro? Not today. <laughs> he's working it. So the, like maybe that that is lies in the question. Like, are you talking about like having been successful, made money? Like there's a difference there. Like you are a pro if you put your energy and time into it and you're out in a professional circuit trying to, you know, be a part of that and qualify for it. And uh, there's there's a difference there. It depends on what the question is. And that's a great point, Will. Um, golf's a great thing to relate to it. No, but like if you go try to qualify for a professional event, you know what? You technically are a professional golfer because you're now playing in an event that you would accept money in. And I would hope that if you were going to do that, that you are a pro on the preparation side. That to me is what becomes pro is like, I'm, you know, identified my talent and abilities and and put stuff around me to be able to try to be successful. Um, So, yeah, I mean, it just depends on kind of where that question lies. Yeah. Yeah. I I think what what you're saying, Matt, I agree with when it comes to like mentality, like people have the mentality of a pro. I think that can be almost for anyone that that's willing to put forth through everything. When I think about it too, I think about like the professionalism of a, a real career. Like if I, if I do, if I go all in as a coach um, and I have the appropriate certificates and or credentials, that's a result of my acts. And then that makes me a professional right now in our sport. We don't have that, right? Like we just can't, we can't be like, Oh, you did this and this you're a pro, right? Officially. We don't have that card. We don't have that. So I think that is, that is interesting. I love Will's point there. Like if you try your best at something and put forth your effort, that certainly doesn't make your, make you a pro. Cause to me, like you need results, like you need results. So you could try all you want. And I'm, and I pursued the NFL for many years of my life and I wasn't good enough to make it there. So I got no problem being like, yo, guess what? You are pro, you ain't a pro. <laughs> and I'll tell you, and I'll be like, you can put forth your best effort. You need to go pick new parents. Otherwise you ain't making it. Cause it's a bit of a genetic play and luck and all these other things too. So it's like, it's, 
it's uh it's tough but i, I love the mentality side where it's like if you want to be pro it first starts with like your your innate ability to prioritize like sacrifice because there's a lot of athletes and you see this i guarantee it all the time max people probably come to you and they're like hey how do i get an agent how do i get support but they're not even putting like training first recovery first already like they're not living as if they're a pro and they'll never have a chance to taste those fruits or like experience that with an agent like yourself if they're not already living that pro lifestyle and like that mindset so yeah i, I man we could run laps around yeah. this till we invent it till we invent no, that, protocol, that baby we're, we're, <laughs> that's it that is it too like when you think about that it's like i think a lot of people here are perceiving that as like they've had success and they've been validated by like he says corn fairy mm -hmm. but there are so many people that are professional golfers that are never achieved that level and they play local circuits they try so i guess maybe there's like you know a difference between what meaning being an actual validated pro is or like trying, you know, you were a pro, you were a professional athlete, Adrian fact, cause you yeah. made your job to go to the NFL. That to me is professional. Um, you're, you know, if you want to say like you were, you know, you meet the NFL or a successful pro or like you're a PGA tour player. Those are like different, you know, sort of badges at that point. Okay. I have tons of friends who are professional golfers that will never sniff the corn fairy tour. And like for, for a lot of people and maybe will is like thinking that that is what it means to be a pro. There's nothing wrong with that. Will. like you, that's your perception of it. I'm just from my experience, honestly, like people the, in the gym right now that are trying to be pros and they are pros. Why? Cause they show up here every day. They don't have anything else going on and they're putting a hundred percent of their energy towards their hopes and dreams and their goals. Right. And, they're betting on themselves. You know what? That's monetary. Like I'm not taking money other places that, and I'm investing it here so that I can get there and be a CrossFit games athlete, which some people would be like, that's pro. Mm -hmm. oh, I mean, if I, you know, if I go to a local comp and I win five grand, technically that's pro because you're getting paid, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I like that. I like that a lot. And you're, and you're right because it is a subjective question for, for everybody. Yeah. But I think conceptually mm -hmm. I, I like, I really like what you you put in focus there of being professional, right? It's like, okay, do I have to, like we said at the beginning, is it a monetary number that makes me professional? Is it a level that I get to? Like, is it only the CrossFit Games? Because, I mean, you, there's some people that got to the CrossFit Games and like, yeah, man, I just, uh, I made it. <laughs> it's like, mm -hmm. I've been doing this at-home thing and I got there. I was like, okay, well, what's the difference between that person that gets top 10 <laughs> or bottom 40? Right, who put their whole that's life? That's a great question. That's a great question to ask. Is like, there are plenty of people that go to the CrossFit Games that don't make money on the sport. Are they pros? Right. It's you know, how do you answer that question? Which is what you're debating here. Which is an mm -hmm. awesome debate. It's just like you know, there's I worked with the most successful people in the history of the sport, and you know, down to people that have been to the CrossFit Games ten times but have never won, and you know, people that have gone once and. Uh, you know, there's all, it depends on what your interpretation of that is. For me, a pro is just, you know, someone who takes that step to, you know, want to be a games athlete. And they, you know, cause you, you said it, Adrian, I think best in a different way. It's just like, it's sexy to, you know, say, I want to be a professional athlete. It, then it gets down to like, what's required to actually do that. And we go like everybody that I worked with and we coach goes through layers of like learning what that means, you know, through success and failures, uh, what that means, you know, my number one baseline is like, well, I was Matt Fraser's coach and agent for, uh, you know, whatever his seven, eight years. And it's like, that it's pretty like, that's, that's my baseline, you know? He, and, but, but forget about his results. It's just like, I saw what it meant to be a pro from my perspective. Mm -hmm. His formula is really good. You know, a lot of people are like, well, he's super talented. Yeah, he's got talent. Nobody worked harder. That's right. a pro. Like, you're just willing to, like, really go in, all in on yourself at that point. And, like, yeah, he had the most success. That's not reality for a lot of people, unfortunately. Because mm -hmm. uh, he just, you know, he had it. And there's differentiators that he had that are me a lot of them are mental, not just mm -hmm. physical. You know, he was mm -hmm. able to do things that he didn't want to do. He hated. He had you know, grit's such an overused word, but yeah, he has a really good definition of grit for me. 
you know he he oh, yeah. you know that's grit like doing he did a lot of shitty stuff and was in a lot of shitty situations and overcame you know so yeah, it's a good debate though i love it honestly it, it, in a in a good way though like we're in a really good place you know the sports gone through a lot of changes and a good you know change is good like we got to really find our place we got to settle in but the marketing side's great. Like the athletes move the needle for brands and they're getting paid really well and more and deeper. Right. And that's all we can ask at this yeah, point. Yeah. And I got, I got a question for you. Um, just in regards to like all this and I, and I'm aware, like we see it in the space. It seems like there's, I mean, tremendous momentum, man, like within where we're at as a movement CrossFit itself, both from HQ to non non-associated competitions and different ways for athletes to have opportunities. And we know it's kind of been a little bit of this, but I got to ask you, Matt, in your opinion, like I, I look at, I look at Frazier and I think about the way that he was so singularly focused for so many years, obsessive. Right. And this is, again, you talk about grit, like, man, you know, we could, we could also have a podcast about that <laughs> in itself, I'm sure. But I think about that as a particular skill set. And because he was successful, it created more freedom for him to have that singular focus. Some of these athletes today I see, and I don't know if I call this a distraction because social media seems to be not like needed, like YouTube. Oh, I got to have a vlog, Instagram. Oh, I got to post for all these brands. And, and, and I know there's support there, people helping them do those things, but it's like, at what point from an agent's perspective and with your experience, do you say like, Hey, keep first things first. Like you gotta, you gotta perform, you gotta compete. Like this is what we're here for. Not all this other stuff that, that might be gaining you in popularity. And how do you balance it? Cause we see also not to distract from the question, but we see also athletes that are like, yo, my social media though is balling. My performance isn't so balling. So I'm making more money cause I'm balling on social media. How do we, how, what, what's your opinion on kind of that global take there, Matt? It's a really hard question to answer because there's, <laughs> I know, man. There's, it, 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 true, <laughs> truly, truly. And, and it's a great question because some people that is the way that they monetize, professionalize themselves. And like, you know, their results maybe at best are like, I'm always going to be 20th or less at the CrossFit game show up. And that creates the platform for, you know, no matter what it is that people are attracted to me around that I can then push forward further through my platforms. And then as like, you're at your questions. Great. Like where does somebody like me come into this to say like, Hey, like chill out. Like if you just keep focusing here, that comes to like being around people that can really assess properly what makes sense and your belief in yourself. I mean, you know, you guys have heard, you both played so many different sports over time. You've heard it enough is like anybody can do anything if they put their mind to it. I'm, I, I don't want to like discourage kids or anything like that. And it's like, that's not always the case, you know? And, and the reason why I didn't play football. <laughs> yeah. It's like, you know, and I've gone through this, honestly, like through my experience with sports, the reality is, you know, I had grit and I worked my ass off as hard as if not harder than anyone else. And I just didn't have it. You know, it's like, you know, I couldn't play professional baseball. I was a really good baseball player, but it just didn't play out. And I've, you know, you guys probably have gone through this historically with yourselves too. It's just like, I have that, like PTSD is aggressive because that's like a fact for military, but it's like, it is stress after of like regret, you know, it's like, fuck, did I not do something right? Like where, mm -hmm. like, no, you just didn't have it, dude. And like, look where you're doing now. Like you've taken that energy somewhere else and that's it. Right. Like I look at my situation historically through the last 20 years, it's like, you know, having people like I did good around me that were like, hey, dude, the baseball thing's really cool, but like you need to go get a job, you yeah. know, and, and that's kind of where I have to sit in this thing is, you know, and the nice part for a lot of people in this space, because it's such a cool space and, and has so many great opportunities through social media. And, you know, it's a, it's a, it's unique in that. Like, the, like, if you look at an NBA player, if I like told you, you know, I don't even know an example off the top of my head, but there's plenty of guys you watch on the floor that are probably to you as famous in the world as anybody that have like 50,000 Instagram followers. Cause it's just like a different world yeah, over yeah. there. Right. So true. And here, like you have athletes that have, you know, done not a ton at the CrossFit games that have over a million followers. Right. You know, men and women can totally be, you know, there's a lot more women on that side, but there are men too. Right. And it's so, what an opportunity because you know what, when a guy like me is like, Hey, like, let's be, you know, be real about the business side here. You know, 
they can do both. Like they can have a job, a job that pays them and still do some fun stuff with a passion of theirs and, you know, be pro. Right. And they just have to focus a little more on, you know, their content and their voice and the platform and their brand. Mm. It's a tough question to answer because, you know, you like measure it here. Like we're, we we're now coaching uh, 10 athletes that are pros and legit, you know, people you would say those are pros and, yep. um, and it's, um, you know, some of them later in the career, some of them brand new. Like we just took on this kid from France, Victor Hoffer. It's like, you know, oh, nice. he's a good one. He's a good one. Like, you know, where, you know, and I've been through this many times with athletes is like, you know, is there a point he comes to me and he's like, Hey man, I've been to the games five times now. And mm-hmm. you know, a podium twice. And like, what am I doing? Like, you know, what do I say to him? You know, at yeah. that point is, you know, I have good feel is the only thing I can answer it with you. It's just like, it, it's, you know, I can be like really objective and about what people's talents are in runway. And I can also be objective now in a coaching position to be like, Hey, like now's the time to go find another coach. Cause maybe we're just tapped on with you, you know, mm. and those moments will come up with us. We're, we're just good at, that it's like i'm not always the answer is my point you know and mm. that's on the agent side i've done that historically and we will on the coaching side it's just a hard thing to there's no like it's what we're asking on the first side there's no like you know really structure to what it means to like do this then this next or like be a pro right it's like you know what people make of it and sometimes it is cited on social media you know um, and uniquely like that can look two ways people think distracting I don't look at it always that way. Yeah. Would that have been distracting to Matt Fraser? Yes. Is the answer. Right. And we try to keep him away from that as much as possible, even as hard as that was like, you know, he has that in a really good place in his life. Right. And, um, but you know, is that distracting to X, Y, Z athlete? That's, you know, pretty much finishing 10th to 20th at the games. It's a little less weighted on that. Like that appearance is great. And like they're present, it's things to talk about and tell their story. Their story is now, Hmm helping them make money and be professional, you know? Um, And that's okay too. Like, I love that. And it's really fun. And also sometimes you see that thing be the catalyst for how people do actually eventually unlock things they didn't even know they could on the athletic side, you know? So that's a really roundabout, ambiguous Uh, answer. uh, Well, part of that too is it sounds like it's also athlete dependent. Like Matt didn't do social media because his sole goal was to be the greatest person to ever do this sport and have that like an unequivocally equivocal contention when that comes up right like i i learn how unique he is more every day it, it, i believe it um, and yeah i'm his guy right like i get it like i'm a homer really you know, <laughs> ten thousand foot view like you know the more you coach too because you know he's a hero for guys like jason hopper like they looked mm-hmm. up to him and it's like you know they want to be him and what it is and it's the trap it, and we've made mistakes with this with coaching back to you is to like look at them too much like how we would look at matt or Mm -hmm. even him the same to say like i don't get why he doesn't get this um and then learning to coach you know and he's becoming an incredible coach because of that he's like really been able to look at it and say oh wow like i don't get that maybe i need to show like Mm -hmm. get you know in better shape to be able to do it alongside them more moving forward but yeah like matt is i mean i he's very unique you know, in, in his skill sets and his application and like his desire, like there's man, what, you know, it makes me more and more grateful on the daily for what I got to experience. Like it, we were just in Colorado at Josh Bridges wedding and we took a hike and not intentional, but like we were just like reflecting on the past, which is so fun. And it was just like, dude, you're an animal. Like you, and, and he was like, I was, you know, in, in, in a good way, he was just kind of like, Sometimes it scares me what I was, you know, and he's like, you know, I don't, but, but yeah, I mean, I'm learning that through now coaching. He's like some of these things that I thought were just like easy because it was how I was wired. They're yeah. different. You know, he's unique dude. And so cool. You know, it's just like, we, we, I hope we get to see that again, honestly. Mm-hmm. Um, because he, he had it, man. Yeah. He had it. This is a good question before we, we s- switch gears real quick. Um, how long did it take Matt to get over his athletes not being like him as far as mindset 
and focus. And I feel like this is a question asked about, say, like all time greats that maybe try to turn to coaching after their career and being able to coach people and then maybe understand is like, listen, there's a reason why there's nobody like you because there's nobody like you. So to try to make another you, I think could be the biggest mistake for new coaches that had great success, maybe as athletes. He's so humble that it's hard for him to do that individually. Okay. And, you know, so it's, it's, it's a unique situation. If like, we'd like get into the psyche there. It's just one of his weaknesses is like, you know, detrimental humility, honestly. Like if he really thought as much of how great he was, it could be a, a weapon too at times. And, I, you know, you could also argue like mm. it could turn the wrong way. I love where he sits. So it takes people like myself and others around us to be like, hey, like, you know, this is something that you're kind of falling in a trap of. Like these aren't people like you, but it was quick. You know, he's just like, he's really good at like, he wants to be the best coach ever. Like just like you want to be the best athlete, you know? So he just like really works hard at it. We do a lot of education and he digs in and, and, you know, he's really reflective on that. And he's like, why don't I feel like this is something, am I being clear? Or no, you're not, you're not because <laughs> you just don't, you know, and this is like a while ago, like, you know, we still, str by the way, like the reality is if people are real, especially on the coaching side, you're probably never there. Right. Like you just, it's just, just like an athlete. It's, it's yeah. the same it's thing. Really, yeah. yeah. It's and I love that. Cause it's just opportunity. You know? mm -hmm. And we're like digging in. I'm so pumped for this year. And, you know, because of getting better on the coaching side and like investing more of our energy and resources towards that. Cause it's, you know, it's an area we didn't know how much we would do. And now have, we had a lot of fun and it was a, it was a different type of year from our prior experiences for what, you know, from people we coached and we internalize that. We look in the mirror and we're like, well, how can we get better at that? And it's the same yeah. for like he, the hardest, you know, he, man, he's so hard on himself and, and it, it hasn't stopped with like retiring from athletics, you know? Mm -hmm. So yeah, he's unlocked that and understands that. And that's perspective he has to work on because it, I think the the easier way to work on that with him. And I think you know he'll do more of it is he can show and tell a little bit, you know, that's a really unique gift of um, an ability he has is like, you know, if, and he's aware of it, like if I can't tell you or articulate it, right. Give me, give me my shorts and my shoes. I'm going to show you. you know? <laughs> yeah. You know, and it's like, you know, Hey, do you want to watch Michael Jordan shoot baskets? Yes. Yes. You know? <laughs> so it's like, it's super cool. You know? Yeah. He, yeah. I'm proud of him. He's working hard at it. We are. It's fun. It's fun. It's not easy, but it's fun. And, and, you know, uh, it will be a hard year. We're asking people to do a lot of hard things uh, yeah. and, um, ourselves too. So, but what are we, yeah, coaching is a roller coaster ride. So to switch gears more towards, um, I actually would love to go down this Matt rabbit hole for a long time, but I'll <laughs> rail it back onto the competitive side is that we talked yeah, about yeah. what we perceive as a professional athlete, the pursuit of being a professional athlete and things like that, but you can't have the pursuit without the opportunity. So let's, when you shift gears more to the opportunities, whether it's more competitions or bigger seasons or off seasons and game seasons, is what are some of the things that you look at that you think would help provide more or better opportunities for people to become or pursue that professional CrossFit Games athlete career? Yeah, th this is an easy one for me. And I think I don't think it's anything that all of us collectively CrossFit, you know, as the keeper of that aren't, aren't recognizing is, is just more structure to, you know, what, what is the, what is the sort of path? What, you know, what, what's the, the journey look like to be, you know, you know, having more structure and feet, you know, a feeder system. It's not hard because you can derive a lot of energy from other sports. And, that, and again, mm -hmm. knowing where the traps are for us being different, but we need to create a more consistent opportunity for the best athletes to be on the floor. And that next layer of athletes to have a, a way to prove themselves, not always having to just, you know, qualify for the level to be with the best athletes, which is harder to then, you know, you know, it's like that golf model of like different layers. It's baseball, mm -hmm. single A, double A, triple A. It's like, you know, we need to figure out that, which everybody knows and they're working on, um, you know, to get to a point where we can say like, this is what it means to be a touring pro athlete with us at the highest level. And this is what, you know, triple A is and double A and like, you know, yeah. you know what's, you know, what somebody sent to me recently that I thought was fascinating is, um, you know, disc golf. Um, and 
you know, honestly, like I've watched it from a distance. Like it's not my cup of tea, but it's, you know, I am a sports geek, so I can kind of watch anything, but that I've always been a little distant from that, but then they sent me how they're structured. And I was like, wow, that's really interesting. It's just like, they have a really good way of, um, I think it's more on the tennis model of like, power rating tournaments and like who attends then dictates how many points are available. And, um, and then it just like gives even, you know, the local kid that's never done it before happened to show up and figure out that he had talent there that the points that associated with that to then, you know, be a catalyst. So, yeah, I mean, that's it for me. It's just more structure. Like we mm-hmm. have, you know, it's time we've done and this a long time. Structure on top of yes. that, right. Yeah, Not yeah. year to year. Yeah. Not we'll get there. I say that's a trap. Like people will be like, yeah, we've been saying we'll get there for years. This is hard too. What, you know, Dave and Don and the whole team does, it's hard, you know? And you just said something really important. Let's take a step back and clap and say, like, this is one of the fastest growing sports in history. And so I love the demand from, you know, the fan base and Mm -hmm. the community. It's accountability and everybody needs it. Right. And it's, uh, and, and, no matter what you see or look at it, sometimes you can't look at them and be like, well, you know, they're trying. Like, people aren't trying to create situations where it's painful or it doesn't work. Like, they're not they're trying to make this worse. We promise. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and so, like, there's a lot of things. Sometimes it's like, you know, experience dictates that. I think for a long time, we thought we were way different. And that's okay. Like, because there is some reality to being different. Mm-hmm. And I, I see that more now today than ever. And, and, you know, I think Dave did a really good job with that, with the lead up is like, you know, the trap would have been at that point to be like, we're like golf and just go do it. That might've like, you know, stunted our growth at some point. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, I think we're all recognizing now there is a time at which like, it makes more sense. The evolution is structure season points. Like how do we get there, you know, and, and have more people on the floor more consistently. Like I want to see, you know, all those guys that are on the games floor accountable to compete other times together. Like you see it right now with Rogue. Like some people are choosing yeah. not to, some are. And some people even measure that of like, well, am, if I do this, is it a, in, in, you know, Justin does and I'm Pat and I don't, am I an ad advantage at the games? Like, let's just take this away from them on that and like pick mm. a series of events that they, sh- they all do oh. that means something to them. And yeah. then we can just train and like go compete and, like every other sport does. And, and then it's in the, it's a level playing field on that side. Mm-hmm. You know, I think, I think that's it just like, you know, and then structuring the pathway for people to progress. What do you think some of the biggest limiters are right now to get to maybe where we want to go? Well, it's always, you know, the, 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 the it's, it's always money. You know, I think that, you know, we're in a unique position where there's a lot of people invested and willing to continue to invest brands, you know, platforms. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think the limiting factor is being currently overcome, which is like people sitting at a table that come from different spots that can collaborate to put this together. Collaboration is at, going really well right now. Which so is... That, that, very right. new and I would say refreshing from a, mm-hmm. I mean, HQ standpoint when it comes specifically to the sport. Yeah. That, I give those guys a lot of credit because I know how, like I ran Wadapalooza. I know how you feel when somebody, <laughs> you need to do this. Yeah, you know? I mean, you have like, the experience with something like this. Yeah. And it's like, um, so, you know, that experience for me grounded me a lot and gave me a lot more, you know, respect on that side. And, they're doing a good job with that. I know like some people can, you know, have optics on some things like, where's the games? Like, when is nobody talking to me? Like generally now I want people to look at that and be like, cause they're figuring shit out. Like, mm-hmm. you know, they, the communication's there. I know it is. And I know the experience from the consumer has to be there to have had received that or like seen it. People are just trying to do this right. And, 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 they're, and they're urgent and they're collaborating and communicating. I'm excited because of that. Yeah, like nothing's ever perfect. Like there's always things that we can get better at. It's like to base that as your judgment of good or bad is ridiculous. Yeah, we're getting better, which is like, you know, I feel that. And if people who aren't, you know, I believe that you will. Uh, and, I, and I'm excited about it. I, you know, and I don't like know this like crazy amount that others don't know. Yeah, I'm super involved in a lot of different things with the sport, but 
Um, I believe in the, the people now that are in place to do these things. I really do. And, um, and, you know, I think that there's a really cool platform, you know, people are collaborating and there's like great conversations that will be had because these people see that, like, you know, Don's a perfect example of it. Don wants more people to experience this. That's like what a North, right? And we've all, we've heard others say that, but then there's actions around it that I'm seeing, you know, mm -hmm. it's just like, I want more people to do CrossFit. I want more people to go to the games. I want more people to watch the CrossFit games. And then there's, that's a great theory, which we've heard many times, but I'm seeing that, you know, get into action with him and Dave and others. Okay. Uh, one more for you while I got you is you know, uh, some questions around say, and, th and this has been as like the growth of CrossFit as a whole, the popularity of CrossFit worldwide, the number of affiliates that we're having, is it going up, going down? Like the trend of fitness and, and aspect. And then over this last couple of years is the trend of the popularity of the CrossFit games. Is it going to survive in the next five years or, you know, is it just going to peter out like, you know, a little, not a flash in the pan. You can't do that for 17 years and call it a flash. <laughs> from your perspective in the time at which you came in, saw the growth that we had, some of the, the stumblings along the way to this point. Now, what is your opinion of the direction of the sport of CrossFit that it could be going in the next three to five years? I see I see it growing and because I see us identifying the areas that have maybe held us back. Um, and, you know, it could, it, it, there's a number of factors and it's, you know, system geography, like all these things that are going on. These guys have, everybody has a data point right now. Like they're moving the CrossFit games next year, which is mm -hmm. great. Cause you know, a new region of the world is going to get to spend some time at this thing and people will see this next year and be like harder to get tickets, all those, you know, right. immediately. And it's, I think they recognize that. It's like, we need to let more people have access to this. It's not as easy for everybody to just hop on an airplane and go places, you know, <laughs> yeah. it's, um, it's gonna, it's gonna grow. Uh, we've got great partners on the media side that are doing really good things. And even some things a little differently, like ESPN, there couldn't be a more perfect place for a sport to be broadcast. Okay. Great. That's a catalyst, you know, um, how they document the season, you know, I don't know what people know or don't, but it's very exciting from what I see. And you, you have like, I mean, honestly, like we're, an, we're a piece of this, you know, as our other platforms like ours and businesses, but like, I look at, you know, where we're at, and I'm in investment mode, Matt is of like, you know, we want more storytelling around our athletes. Like that's where we're at, you know, and there's, you know, we can do it and we're going to do it because we see the opportunity to grow mm -hmm. in the space with the space. And we want to help our athletes grow. We're partnered with CrossFit. Who would have ever thought that programming platforms would be partners at the CrossFit right. Games? There's a great data point for people. Yeah. I, you know, in other programming platforms we did and they did paid to be there for the, and it worked. You know, and, um, you know, that's, cr dude, I mean, you guys have been around a long time. That's crazy. If you had said that 10 years ago, you know, <laughs> I thought like, I was like, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, that's, that's, it's growing and it's gonna, we had a lot of wins this year. Yeah. We had some losses, but there's some, there's really great stuff going on, you know, I, and we have great flagpole events. Rogue's awesome. Uh, Wadapalooza is an incredible opportunity every year and it just mm -hmm. delivers. So does Rogue. You know, it's like, how do we get some of these things in the best position to be more of a longer story, you know, and yeah. we'll get there. And those are the conversations I know are being had and uh, we'll figure this thing out. We have the right people there to figure it out. So That's we're good. going in the right direction. We're not flopping. If we were going to flop, we've tried every other way to do it. So like, yeah, if we um, haven't flopped yet of all the things we have done since 2018 to flop, I think we have done yeah, yeah. and it still hasn't. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, to, to wrap things up is, Yes, partners in the space, camps like, you know, HWPO investing into the growth and success, sponsors, partners, uh, media entities like ESPN. But I think the biggest thing that is still unique to this sport is that the biggest buy-in and support is we can still have is from our community. Yeah. Right. Bringing the bodies into the open, bringing the bodies into the events, the eyes and the live streams, like the power of, not to say the power of the people, but the power of the CrossFit community is, so I would true. say, still one of the biggest and untapped potentials to grow this to the position of which all of these people want it to be 
And I don't think they understand the power that they have to make it so. And so I think that that community to you guys is is one of those things that we do need to put forth. Totally agree. Like the open, let's just, before I leave, like that is the largest sporting event in the history of the world. That's a fact. I don't know if anybody's ever heard that. If it's the first time you guys are hearing that I sat in a presentation from a big brand that was getting into the space and at a boardroom table and it was like all these slides and that slide came up and they're the experts. So they would know. And they said, this is the largest sporting event participation sporting event in the history of the world. There's nothing even close. Wow. What? That's pretty badass. (laughs) So (laughs) that's the power of our community. Right. And it's like, and participation sports hit different anyway, golf, this, yeah, tennis. Yeah. Like, it's just like you've got a more passionate fan base that way a lot of times. Basketball is another example. People don't realize it, but there's a lot. Basketball is a lot like those other sports. Like a mm-hmm. lot of people pick up basketball and play, and that's their fitness, right? So, yeah, it's – um we got a lot of good stuff going on that like, even you look at the open numbers, if they're even like a little stagnant right now, it's still a few hundred thousand people, guys. Like that's crazy. Right. And we're right. going to dig in there and work on that. Somebody asked on that thing over there about us affiliating. We are a CrossFit affiliate, our headquarters. Yep. We're not open to the public, but yes, we will definitely run some stuff. We were talking about it today. Like, I'd love to have badass open workouts here and like yeah. let people sign up and come in. You two come up and do an open workout with us. Hey, look, I got to get in shape if I'm going to go against this guy. <laughs> I need to get him. Let's do this. We have a battle on the HWPO headquarters, the battleground for you New two head to head. Conway versus uh, Ace. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. I love it. Just don't Day. program with any heavy. Yeah, listen, come do Friday Night Lights. Stay for a level one seminar at HWPO. Oh, Bam. Let's do it. Saturday, yeah, Sunday. I am, I'm down for that. Yeah, that CrossFit, let's really make it happen. happen. Well, awesome. Hey, Matt. Now. Thank you for your time, your insight, uh, your expertise, and the conversation. You opened up so many other avenues that uh, I thought were really cool places to to bring some some ears to and some some voices to, and, and to go from there. So uh, I really appreciate your time, Adrian. As always, uh, thanks for adding a good flavor to uh, the the topic at hand. So thank you guys both. Thank you guys for joining the chat. Adrian and I will be back on Friday because another hot fun topic is does size matter when it comes to CrossFit athletes and their success at the CrossFit Games with Mr. Dan Blue Eyes Babyface Bailey. So oh, wow. you. Good. Thank you, you guys watching. We'll see you guys on Friday. Thank you guys. Thanks for having me.